University. Today I'm joined by Professor John Maurer and Professor Paul Kennedy to discuss the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor and Winston Churchill's subsequent visit to the United States and specifically the White House in December 1941. Professor Maurer is the Alfred Thayer Mahan Professor of Sea Power and Grand Strategy and served as the Chair of the Strategy and Policy Department at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. John, thanks for your time today. Paul Kennedy is the J. Richardson Dilworth Professor of History, Director of the International Security Studies at Yale and Distinguished Fellow of the Brady Johnson Program in Grand Strategy. He coordinates the ISS program, which is funded by the Smith Richardson Foundation. He is internationally known for his writings and commentaries on global politics, economic, and strategic issues. Paul, thank you for joining us as well today. My pleasure. So before we begin, I would like to uh, give a big thanks to LLMP Philanthropies for their support of the International Turtle Society and for bringing this program to life. This program is being recorded and we will be posting it on our YouTube page in the coming days. Also, we will be taking questions from the audience and we'd love to hear mm -hmm. from you. So please use the Q&A function on the Zoom webinar to submit your questions and we will try to get as many as possible at the end of this discussion. So I'd like to begin this webinar uh, marking the 80th anniversary tomorrow of the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor <clears throat> with by asking John Maurer to begin our discussion uh, with Winston Churchill in the years leading up to this attack on Pearl Harbor and his writings and his commentary on the rise of Japanese uh, empire and militarism. Please, John. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Churchill had given long thought to Japan's place in world affairs. He uh, understood that Japan was a rising great power. In 1904, 1905, Japan fought Russia and beat Russia uh, in a major war in Northeast Asia. Uh, Japan's army and its navy had proven itself against a European great power. So there was no underestimation of Japan as a potential, potential adversary. Now, and in this earlier period, Japan and Britain uh, were allies with each other. They had formed an alliance in 1902. Uh, Japan uh, worked with Britain during the First World War. Uh, uh, the alliance seemed to work uh, very well for the interests of both countries, these two island empires. After the First World War, however, there was pressure put on Britain to uh, uh, remove itself, uh, to abrogate the alliance with Japan. Americans looked at this Anglo-Japanese alliance as uh, a coalition, potential coalition against the United States. The American uh, Secretary of State, Charles Evans Hughes in particular, was quite vocal with British diplomats uh, that the United States did not like the Anglo-Japanese alliance. Well, at the uh, Washington Conference of Naval Arms Control and Asian Affairs in 1921-22, and we're now looking at the 100th anniversary of that important international conference, uh, the Anglo-Japanese alliance uh, went away. It was replaced by a four power pact, uh, the United States, Japan, Britain, and France, who would look to each other to accommodate each other about developments in Asia. Uh, at the time, Churchill was in favor of getting rid of the Anglo-Japanese alliance. He thought that this was important because Britain shouldn't antagonize the United States. So he favored getting rid of the alliance. Later in the 1930s and in his history, The Gathering Storm, he would say that this was a mistake that Britain should have uh, tried to maintain the Anglo-Japanese alliance, and that if Britain had done so, it would have moderated Japanese behavior on the international scene. But at the time, in the early 1920s, Churchill didn't look at that, uh, at the Japanese alliance in that way. He thought it was more important to put Britain on good terms, good relationship with the United States. In the 1920s, Japan, uh, Churchill tended to downplay the threat from Japan. As Chancellor of the Exchequer in the government of Stanley Baldwin from 1924 to 1929, uh, he resisted 
he resisted spending the money that the Admiralty, the Royal Navy wanted in building up the Singapore base and also uh, recapitalizing the British fleet in cruisers that were directed against Japan. Uh, in a famous note to Stanley Baldwin, he said, why should there be a war with Japan? It won't happen in our lifetime uh, at the end of 1924. Well, uh, Churchill's crystal ball was somewhat cloudy because of course there would be a war with Japan uh, in his lifetime and he would be prime minister when that war came about. Now in defense of Churchill at the time, the 1920s were a period of time where, uh, where Japan looked like it was a responsible stakeholder it was working with the United States and Britain uh, to make sure to try to dampen down conflict uh, in Asia. So Churchill in that time was uh, correct in saying that Japan was not a threat. By the way, at the same time, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt in two articles, one in the journal Asia in 1923 and another in the journal Foreign Affairs in 1928, publicly said what Churchill was saying behind the scenes that there was no real danger at that point from Japan and that Japanese-American relations were getting better at that time. So here you have these two great war leaders that would be in charge of their countries when Japan attacked in 1941, but in the late 1920s, didn't see war as inevitable, quite the reverse. Now the change takes place because of the Great Depression and in Japan, there's a growing militarization that takes place of the leadership leaders who uh, wanted to promote and maintain cooperation with Britain and the United States. Two of the most important, uh, the Japanese Prime Minister Hamaguchi was assassinated in 1931, and uh, the Japanese Finance Minister Takahashi in 1936 assassinated in his own home in his bed uh, by extremists. Uh, so within Japan, you have what uh, the New York Times correspondent in Japan called uh, a government by assassination. So you see a turn toward militarization of J Japanese society in preparation for war and also extremist national view, nationalist views taking hold among Japan's leaders. Uh, Japan in 1931 takes over Manchuria, Manchuria. Northeast China and sets up a puppet state. In 1937, it becomes involved in a major regional war between Japan and China. And Japan embarks on a, a war with China that it becomes a quagmire they can't get out of. Uh, four years before Pearl Harbor, Japan is already at war with uh, China in a major war that it cannot win. Now, during the 30s, Churchill changes his mind about Japan. He sees the danger from Japan. Uh, he uh, indeed highlights in articles that he writes in a number of places that Japan now has become a danger and is a danger not in and of itself, but also because Japan can be involved with Germany uh, in Europe. He writes at one place where he says uh, that if, if, Germany starts a war in Europe, it won't be long before Japan uh, alights, starts a war in Asia as well. So he's aware of the connection between the European theater, what happens in Europe and what happens in Asia, that these two theaters are connected with each other. Churchill also is a big advocate of recapitalizing the British fleet in the 1930s, whereas in the 1920s, he wanted to hold down naval expenditures. In the 1930s, he wants to see British naval expenditure go up. He also wants to see U.S. naval expenditure goes up because he believes that Britain's security in Asia rests, depends upon a strong American Navy as well, able to work with the British Navy in case of Japanese aggression against the British Empire. So Churchill has very much a realist view of the danger that Japan can pose, that this danger uh, is an acute one, especially because uh, Britain also faces a danger close to their home in Nazi Germany. Uh, so Churchill understands that any war with Japan, uh, and here he's consistent throughout the interwar period, any war with Japan, that Britain's ability to be successful in that war requires close cooperation with the United States. And so in the run up to Pearl Harbor, you do see that Churchill is following the lead of the US. He encourages the US to take a hard line stand against Japan, but at the same time, he doesn't wanna be in front of the US and being confrontational with Japan. Uh, he understands that Britain fighting a war in Europe cannot also fight a war in Asia without 
without the support of uh, the United States. So Churchill had long looked at, uh, uh, from before the First World War down to Pearl Harbor, ha had given a great deal of thought and attention to Japan as a potential enemy of the British Empire and just how dangerous it could be. Thank you, John. Um, and you know, I have many questions that regarding your comments that I'll get I'll, we'll get to later in this conversation. Um, I really appreciated your comment that Churchill was a realist when it came to confronting Japan and and something that uh, you know realism and pragma, pragma, pragmatical approaches is something is a hallmark throughout his career. Um, we'll move the conversation to Paul. Uh, Paul. Can you d detail the, the attack on Pearl Harbor and also in, provide some sort of commentary on the naval, uh, you know, the, the, where both America and the UK were in terms of their naval capability and what this attack did? Please, Paul. Yes, indeed. So <clears throat> with regard to the naval dimension of things and then the approach to Pearl Harbor itself, we have to recall that these two navies, the British and the American Navy, were the, indeed the two largest in the world by the end of the 1930s. But the Japanese Navy had been built up to be a very, very formidable competitor, very well modernized and putting a lot of its eggs into the new striking force of long range carrier aircraft. This was something that the British Admiralty and the American uh, Navy took a great deal of concern about, though they didn't fully get a sense of what concentrated carrier naval force could do. As uh, things unfolded from 1939, the beginning of the war in Europe, through to the fall of France in 1940, through to the uh, Japanese takeover of, um, of Southeast Asia in July 1941, and the Allies' decision to have the oil embargo upon Japan, it was clearly a case that tension was bringing, was building up and that something was going to happen. Something was going to give one way or the other by the end of uh, 1941 itself, probably somewhere in December, in late November, early December. What was going to happen, the West was not sure about. They had all sorts of uh, long range radio detectors out wondering where the Japanese, who were clearly mobilizing a large amphibious fleet, some parts of which were heading southwards in early December, some parts of the Japanese army were concentrating armed forces around Hong Kong, likely to take it over. Something was going to happen in early December 1941. What it was, was unclear. This very day that we are, we, you know, are now getting through in, um, in the 6th of December uh, of 80 years, years ago was one in which one must surmise that somewhere in the North Atlantic, in the North Pacific, I beg your pardon, this Japanese long range carrier fleet was keeping uh, radio silence absolutely and completely. It was gonna come, to almost the Aleutian Islands and then turn south and attack from the north. When Sunday, when Sunday, December the 7th, uh, arises in, uh, in Pearl Harbor itself, uh, to the surprise of the garrison there, uh, there, there occurs this vast and unrelenting attack of the Japanese uh, bombers, uh, high-level bombers, torpedo bombers, dive bombers upon this uh, American battle fleet and cruiser fleet anchored in Pearl Harbor. It is a total surprise. There are people who think that there were some indications that one should have known that the attack was going to come on Pearl Harbor. I think there's no evidence from the intelligence records that that would happen. Pearl Harbor is attacked, the American battle fleet is destroyed, the carriers are safe and free, and the news of this getting to Whitehall, getting to Churchill, was one uh, that caused mixed feelings. Um, and I'm John Mara is going to pick up on those mixed feelings, but I'd like to just stress to our viewership 
essentially the mixed feelings were kind of obvious. There was a, a, an amazement that the Japanese had struck so well and so, so heavily and so efficiently. There was a great relief in Churchill's part that Britain and America would be at war against Japan because Japan had struck both of them. But there's a deep concern on Churchill's part for the next few days about whether this war in the Pacific would somehow be joined to the critical war that Britain was fighting against Nazi Germany. What truly historic times were happening, both at Pearl Harbor on the Sunday of December the 7th, but in the next few days until things became realized with Hitler's declaration of war upon the United States on the 10th. And uh, Paul, I, you know, one question that I have for you, um, you know, no, I'll get into it later because I, I, I really want to get into that. Uh, you know, obviously counterfactuals are, uh, you know, a fool's game for most of the time, um, but let's, we'll get into that um, uh, German declaration of war a little later in that significance uh, and potential uh, potential for it to have not happened and what, what would have happened, of course. So allow me to um, continue the conversation by uh, presenting a, a, a short, converse, short conversation on Churchill's response to Pearl Harbor. So December 7th, 1941, Winston Churchill was at Checkers, the Prime Minister's official country residence, uh, dining with guests. Paul, I think Justin froze there. Yes, so there's no audio. Uh, Churchill was at Checkers uh, dining, I think, with John Winnan, the American ambassador, was yes. he not? Yes. When the news comes in. What a fortuitous uh, event that he was with the American ambassador, John. And yes. uh, can you say how, his, how he reacted to this? Well, again, they were astounded. I mean, they heard it on the BBC, uh, 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 Paul, and... Uh, uh, they then uh, wanted to know, have it confirmed whether it was the case that uh, that the U.S. had been attacked. And before long, uh, uh, they put in a call to the White House where, as you know, Roosevelt said, oh, we're all in the same boat now. Uh, uh, but as you pointed out, not really. They're in the same boat that they're at war with Japan, but it, it remained to be determined whether the U.S. would be at war with Germany. Uh, so... Uh, uh, as you said, uh, the initial reaction is very mixed. One, that the U.S. is now in a war, uh, but is the U.S. Uh, in the war with Germany as well, in a global war? And, of course, Churchill could not stay long, even though he enjoyed being at Chequers. He had, a, in his usual sort of energetic way, to rush back to London to call emergency crisis meeting, in particular, to call a meeting with his chiefs of staff because the I'm guessing, John, that the news must have been flowing in all that Sunday going into Monday and Tuesday about what else was happening in the Far East. The news of the uh, Japanese military assault upon the rather small garrison at Hong Kong where they didn't expect much in the way of, um, a, 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 of a fight, just a fight to keep one's honor. The news of Japanese invasion forces that landed close to Malaya. Mm -hmm. um, the news that all sorts of things were happening, attacks on, on uh, the American bases in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, this, was, this was world turning upside down. Justin. We, we see your yes, back. Yes, gentlemen, excuse me. And, and listeners, I apologize for that. This is the dangers of, of hosting <laughs> this Zoom call. So. Um, uh, gentlemen, if you'll remind me, I, what did you hear? Did you hear that I was talking about Churchill being at Checkers? That's Just when you cut off. Okay, That's when you so cut off. yes. Allow me to continue as, as if nothing happened. So Winston Churchill was at Checkers uh, 
uh, the, the prime minister's country residence. And he was there on the evening of December 7th, very late evening. Uh, and his guests included Avril Harriman and the American ambassador, Gil Winant. They heard the news over the radio and it was reported uh, after Gil Winant called uh, the, uh, the president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, to confirm that Churchill and Winant did a jig in celebration of hearing the news. Um, so a few days later, Winston Churchill proposed, uh, not really, not really uh, asking, but inviting himself, him and his generals over to Washington to be uh, with uh, the, the Americans. And they went over in the Duke of York, uh, whose sister ship, the Prince of Wales, had sunk just three days earlier off of, off of Malaya. And they arrived a few days before um, uh, Christmas. And at their first press conference with when FDR welcomed Winston Churchill in the White House, Churchill had to stand on a chair. It was so there were so many people in the room. Churchill had to stand on a chair to uh, make sure that everybody saw him. Uh, and so the next so on December 23rd, um, that after that press conference, um, they held the annual lighting of the National Christmas Tree at the White House, which was attended over 15, 000, by over 15,000 people. And let me show you just a very quick clip of that, of that speech, um, which, which still resonates today. Give me one moment, please. That was all. Here in the midst of war, raging and roaring, over all the lands and seas, creeping nearer to our hearths and homes. Here, amid all these tumults, we have tonight the peace of the spirit in each cottage home and in every generous heart. Therefore, we may cast aside, for this night at least, the cares and dangers which beset us and make for the children uh, an evening of happiness in a world of storm. Here then, for one night only, each home throughout the English-speaking world should be a brightly lighted island of happiness and peace. Let the children have their night of fun and laughter. Let the gifts of Father Christmas delight their play. Let us, grown-ups, share to the full in their unstinted pleasures. Before we turn again to the stern task and formidable year that lie before us, resolve that by our sacrifice and daring these same children shall not be robbed of their inheritance or denied their right to live in a free and decent world. And so, and so, in God's mercy, a happy Christmas to you all. That was so. And just a few days later, uh, on dis after a quiet Christmas at the White House, Churchill Gay addressed joint session of the American Congress. I'd like to play a small clip of that speech. Members of the Senate and of the House of Representatives of the United States, I feel greatly honored that you should have uh, invited me to enter the United States Senate chamber and uh, address the representatives of both branches of Congress. The fact that my American forebears have for so many generations played their part in the life of the United States, and that here I am 
and Englishmen welcomed in your midst make this experience one of the most moving and thrilling in my life, which is already long and has not been entirely uneventful. I, I, wish, I wish indeed that my mother, whose uh, memory I cherish across the veil of years, could have been here to see. By the way, uh, I cannot help reflecting that if my father had been uh, American and my mother British, <coughs> instead of the other way around, uh, I might have got here on my own. <laughs> Churchill's visit to, uh, this visit to Washington, and then he also went to Ottawa uh, in Florida over the, the weeks was eventful, not just for those speeches, but also for him personally. Uh, and there's some wonderful stories that come out of this, come out of this visit, and I'll, and I'll um, touch on a few right now. But let's, uh, I will start with that, that same night that he gave the, uh, his speech to the joint session of Congress, Churchill was in his bed in the White House, in the Rose Room, which was also known as the Queen's Room, as it was the room that Queen Elizabeth slept in during her 1939 visit with King George VI. And he was unable to sleep because the room was too hot. And Churchill attempted to open the window. And in doing so, he felt a dull pain over his heart and coupled with shortness of breath. And in Churchill's own words, the pain radiated down his left arm. So there's been a lot of research and a lot of um, analysis on this uh, uh, health scare of his, but I will revert to um, a recent book by doctors Alistair Vale and John Scadding called uh, Churchill's Illness, Winston Churchill's Illnesses. So they provide findings of Dr. John Parkinson, who concluded that Churchill experienced a, quote, temporary embarrassment of the coronary circulation, which produced pain under stress in subsequent breathlessness. <clears throat> and so was that a heart attack? And, you know, it sounds like one, but I, I still believe that he did not suffer one. And it seems that doctors Vale and Scadding uh, certainly agree with that conclusion as well. Um, I'd like to also touch on Churchill as a guest at the White House. So when Franklin Roosevelt first was told that Churchill was coming, uh, he kept the news of who the, who the guest would be from his wife, Eleanor, because it was top secret. And all he said was that he instructed his wife, Eleanor, to, quote, see that we had good champagne and brandy in the house and plenty of whiskey. <laughs> so I, that could have given her, <laughs> given her some sort of, some sort of uh, heads up of who it was. But she, due to security reasons, she did not know that it was Winston Churchill coming over. Um, and he was also, he also had these wonderful conversations with Alonzo Fields, who was the White House butler for decades at the White House. And um, he, he uh, allowed me to say that uh, Winston, at, when he, one of the mornings there, said to Fields, quote, I must have a tumbler of sherry in my room before breakfast, a couple of glasses of scotch and soda before lunch, and French champagne and 90-year-old brandy before I go to sleep at night. So these, these recollections are from, are from Alonzo Fields. Um, and he goes on to say that one evening, Churchill called Fields into his room at about 1.30 a.m. And he said, quote, the prime minister asked for another bottle. And then looked at Fields and said, I'm not too sure about you. I need somebody I can depend upon. And when the puzzled Fields asked how he might serve, Churchill responded, quote, if ever I am accused of being a teetotaler, I want you to come to my defense. To which Field said, my dear prime minister, I will defend you to the last drop. So th these stories are, are, you know, are uh, quite rich. And in a time of such intense strain, provide real light into who Winston Churchill was, as, uh, of course, as a person, as a guest, and who, how he treated others. And I will end my section of this discussion on the famous bath story that, that uh, John and Paul may know, and, and many of our viewers may know. Um, so on the morning of January 1st, 
Franklin Roosevelt had made the decision to change the name of the allies fighting the Axis countries to the United Nations instead of the Associated Powers. And he felt he needed to share that, that change with Churchill at once. So Churchill was either in the bath or freshly out of it. But regardless, when Roosevelt entered, Churchill was completely naked. Patrick Kinna, who was a British stenographer who was taking notes with Churchill, uh, uh, being dictated to by a naked Churchill in the bath, which is a, 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 a thing that Winston Churchill did with many of his secretaries, he recalled that when Roosevelt appeared, Churchill said, quote, you see, Mr. President, I have nothing to conceal from you. From Churchill's point of view, he denied saying this, but he did say to King George VI after he returned from Washington, quote, sir, I believe I am the only man in the world who has received the head of a nation without any clothes on. And finally, from, from Franklin Roosevelt's point of view, and this is according to both his personal secretary, Grace Tully, and his confidant, Daisy Suckley, um, he, Franklin called on Churchill in his room and he found, quote, a pink cherub drying himself with a towel and without a stitch on. He's pink and white all over. So with three, with three, uh, with three, you know, in-person uh, primary references, I, I can, I'm sure we can attest that, that 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 did certainly happen. So not only was this uh, uh, a meeting and a visit of, of people and humans and, and you know, um, peoples who share an English language, but it was a military meeting. And the course of the war was uh, at least initially decided. And, and as uh, John referred to initially, um, or maybe Paul, excuse me, uh, once that, once Japanese attacked the Americans at Pearl Harbor, the British were concerned that the Americans would want to uh, defeat the Japanese as a priority over helping the helping defeat the Nazis, but this was dispelled actually by General George Marshall in the first meeting of of the generals between the two nations. That they they did know that the defeating Germany was was of the utmost priority. So, if I can ask John to uh, to end our conversations, and then we'll get into all these questions um, about this greater strategic importance between the military uh, and Churchill's views on that, John. Yes, uh, on the uh, voyage, Justin, as you mentioned, over on the battleship Duke of York, and it was um, uh, a, a difficult uh, crossing, a stormy crossing across the Atlantic. Uh, everybody was getting seasick uh, and taking their favorite medicines to try to avoid becoming seasick. Churchill used the time to write up two long memos about how he thought the war would progress. One for the war in Europe, and another for the war in the Pacific. Uh, these are interesting documents because they lay out, they lay out Churchill's views about how to win the war uh, and what he thought would be the optimal strategy uh, for winning the war. Initially, as you said, Justin, the British military leaders and Churchill uh, were concerned that the Japanese attack would lead to the United States taking its war production and keeping it for American forces. And that Lend-Lease both to Britain and to the Soviet Union would suffer as a consequence. And that Britain and the Soviet Union would have a harder time to fight against uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, coming over here, one of the goals then that Churchill had was to try to maintain Lend-Lease even as the US was building up its own armed forces at this time. Another concern, of course, uh, was that the United States, the American people infuriated by the Japanese attack would make the main effort, American effort in the Pacific. Even after Hitler declared war on the United States, the uh, Britain feared that the American public would wanna direct the war to the Pacific, uh, offensive operations there. Indeed, one of the reasons why Hitler declared war on the United States was that he wanted to encourage the Japanese to be as aggressive as possible to tie down American resources in the Pacific so that uh, he would have more time to defeat the Soviet Union in, in Europe. So in the documents that Churchill wrote, 
uh, he envisioned the war going in the following way. In 1942, that British and American forces in the European theater would be able to uh, fight on the peripheries, in particular in the Mediterranean and clear out North Africa. In 1943, he saw what he called liberating offensives where uh, British, American, Canadian forces would land on the European continent in various places uh, to liberate the conquered countries of Western uh, Europe. And then he envisioned that 1944 would see the uh, final assault on the Nazi citadel, the invasion of Germany crossing the Rhine. So as he's coming over, he has a timetable in which the war ends essentially a year earlier than what it did. And so the question then is, well, why is it that the war took a, a year longer, the defeat of Nazi Germany, than what actually happened? Uh, and one is that American war production uh, had to peak, which really occurs in 44, and Paul can talk about that, uh, the strength of the US Navy growing, uh, but also training of American ground forces took longer than what had been anticipated. The Japanese offensives did divert forces to the Pacific and Roosevelt had to have offensive operations in the Pacific, not one, but two major offensives, one under MacArthur coming out of Australia and another across the Central Pacific led by Admiral Nimitz. Uh, this was required because American public opinion by almost two to one when asked during the war who was the main enemy of the United States would say Japan. Churchill, by the way, was aware that uh, he had to placate American opinion on this, and so his speeches in the United States always refer to the fact that Britain had an interest at stake in fighting Japan as much as the United States. So he's not tone deaf about American public opinion, quite the reverse. Churchill is very much aware of the sentiment that the Pacific is the main theater in the minds of the American people, even as our top strategists, as you said, Marshall, and Roosevelt, are all saying that it's Germany first, we should devote to Germany first. Mm -hmm. One final factor I wanna highlight is we like to say the enemy gets a vote. Uh, war is an interaction. And no matter what plan we come up with, when we execute it, we go up against an adversary and in Nazi Germany's case, a very dangerous, well-armed adversary. And the result is that the campaign in North Africa, which had been hoped would be over quickly, uh, once the landings took place in North Africa and Montgomery coming out of Egypt, that fighting took much longer than anticipated because Hitler reinforced the German forces in Tunisia. And the result was the fighting in North Africa went down to May of 1943. It was May of 1943 before North Africa was clear. And it takes six months to redeploy the forces from the Mediterranean around to uh, England for a cross channel attack. So that meant that uh, redeployment of forces from the Mediterranean to, around to Britain wouldn't be accomplished until November or December, uh, too late to do a cross-channel attack with winter weather. And so instead it was decided to be strategically opportunistic and invade Sicily and then Italy, which had an impact then on the cross-channel attack being delayed until June of 44. So there were a variety of factors that explain why the war in Europe took longer than anticipated by Churchill when he first went over. But there is an optimism though in these documents that the war will be won. One final thing that should be made note, uh, the Second World War, of course, was also the first nuclear war. And even before Pearl Harbor, uh, British scientists and engineers had written up a report about uh, the importance of nuclear weapons. They shared this information with uh, the United States and Roosevelt understood the importance uh, of this. And so before Pearl Harbor, he's writing to Churchill to say, Britain and the United States with Canada have to collaborate to develop these nuclear weapons because the fear is that Nazi Germany will be developing these weapons. So this is an arms race, not just of ground forces, of air power, of navies, but also it's the beginning of uh, a nuclear age as well. Thank you, John. We have received some really great questions, and I'd like to, uh, to spend the rest of this conversation about 15 minutes answering those questions and posing them to, to you and Paul. Um, let me first answer a very short and easy one. Uh, this was submitted by George. George asks, what port did Churchill arrive in the United States, and how did he transit to Washington from that port? George, he arrived at Hampton Roads, Virginia, and then he flew 
to National Airport in Washington and was was actually greeted by Franklin Roosevelt on the tarmac. Um, so there were two questions about Len Lee's. The first from our shared dear friend Alan Packwood from the Churchill Archives. Thanks for watching today, Alan. And then um, a man named John. So uh, I'll, uh, John, maybe I'll ask you this. So John asked, can you please quickly explain the concept of Len Lease? And then uh, Alan did say, and you, you kind of touched on this, John, but maybe just very quickly, how did Pearl Harbor complicate things for the British and Churchill in Lend Lease? If you could just reiterate that. Uh, yes, Lend Lease was something that was put into place in the beginning of 1941. Uh, it's something that uh, is meant to support both Britain and then after the Soviet Union is attacked on June 22nd, 1941, Lend Lease is also uh, given to the Soviet Union. And the idea is that the U.S. is the arsenal of democracy. Again, before Pearl Harbor, the United States uh, were skittish about getting involved in a war. American public opinion understands the danger from Nazi Germany, the danger from Japan. But at the same time, the isolationist movement is very strong. And so Roosevelt is, how can I help these countries fighting uh, Germany? Uh, um, and also China. We often forget that nationalist China is involved in a war with Japan and tying down the bulk of the Japanese army on the mainland of Asia. So to support those countries fighting these aggressor states, the United States wants to give aid supplies of all sorts, and it can be um, uh, trucks, jeeps, food. Uh, by 1943, we're providing rations to feed about 11 million Soviet citizens, which is the strength of the Red Army. In effect, the United States is feeding the Red Army. So lend -Lease is critically important uh, to subsidize the, the war effort of our, of our uh, allies against Germany before Pearl Harbor. But again, as war production goes up, we can continue Lend-Lease and at the same time rearm um, uh, uh, build up American forces, naval and, and ground. Paul has a book that's coming out next uh, April, I believe, Paul, yeah. that looks at the growth of American naval power uh, oh. uh, at this time as well. Um, Paul, a question for you. Um, you talked about how the Japanese went all in on long range carriers, aircraft carriers, as their strategy for building up their Navy. So my question to you is, was that a fateful decision? Um, and, and when those carriers were, you know, eventually defeated uh, one by one, uh, could they not protect their homeland? And, you know, why did they decide to go all in on these carriers? So part of the Japanese Navy was maybe even most progressive set of naval officers. So air power, air naval power officers in the world, they could see that they had a chance of striking fast, striking first, then returning and getting out of the battle. And maybe this was a, a, a way of uh, taking a greater advantage of the American and, and quite frankly, the British Navy's trend, tendency to still think of battleships and the battle fleet as the main core of, of naval power. Uh, it worked brilliantly at Pearl Harbor. Uh, none, of the, uh, none of the Japanese fleet carriers were damaged at all. Very few of the aircraft that were in the attack, hundreds of them uh, were shot down. Uh, for six months after that, the Japanese carrier forces ran rampage in the Pacific into the Indian Ocean. Uh, and until they began to meet opposition. And the opposition they met was ironically, and uh, perhaps you may say out of fate, not uh, naval surface battle fleet opposition, but that of the US carriers which had escaped attack at Pearl Harbor. How fortuitous it was that Halsey and the other carriers were at sea on the morning of December the 7th. It was those carriers and a few more coming in which fought in the critical naval battle of Midway at the end of May, beginning of June 1942. And in that battle destroyed four of those main Japanese carriers which had attacked Pearl Harbor. From that time onwards, the Japanese, at least in naval carrier uh, power, felt hemmed in, unable, unwilling to try to do anything more significant beginning to draw their lines of defense right away across the Pacific, waiting for the Americans to come on. So within six months, 
of that amazing strike, amazingly successful strike on Pearl Harbor, the, 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 the tide of battle had changed and it was a tide of battle in the Pacific that was to be overwhelmingly fought by long range aircraft carriers. And at this, the American advantage, when the new carriers come in 1943, John is quite correct to say it's 43 where the real tilt and the balances occur then with more and more carriers coming into the Pacific, the Japanese have less and less chance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was a fateful decision for them to, to certainly, and I, I appreciate your point that they were, lib, you know, they were progressive. They, they, they saw that, you know, this was a way of expanding their influence and in their empire. Um, but certainly it was an all in decision on their part. Yes. John, or excuse me, Paul, if I can uh, stay with you, I'd like to ask a question. This is from Mark Brown, um, and it's speculative, but I think we should ask it. He says, the fact that Churchill had the two most senior American representatives for dinner during, or at very least soon after the attack on Pearl Harbor, almost seems too much of a coincidence. Did Churchill know anything about the pending attack on the Japanese? And if, before you answer, Paul, if I may say to Mark, uh, it was not uncommon, it was actually frequently common for Winston Churchill to host Avril Harriman and Gil Winant uh, in those, in those year, months that they were there in, in 1941. Um, they were almost, I don't want to say inseparable because that's not true, but they ran in the same circles and Churchill was uh, actively uh, courting the Americans in, in London to support, to support his... Uh, his push to bring the Americans into war. So it's uh, it's not surprising to me whatsoever that they were over for dinner. But Paul, do you know if he knew of any sort of information about the attack? So two more points to what you say. Um, it would be interesting to know how many times uh, Churchill's favorite American, Harry Hopkins, was yeah. in and out <laughs> uh, Chartwell and, and also 10 Downing Street for dinner. This was but Churchill enjoyed Americans and he enjoyed late nights and he enjoyed having them over. What's more, they had a lot to talk about, perhaps not just about what may be happening in the Pacific and Far East. They were all acutely aware that the, this vast German army was at that stage in those very weeks on the outskirts of Moscow. What was going to happen there? Would Stalin's army crack? Would Stalin's nerve crack? And what was going to happen, uh, surely the Americans wanted to be updated about what was happening in the, in the war in North Africa and the Mediterranean. So they did have a lot to talk about. And it is true that they would probably uh, often be saying when the United States is in the war or if the United States comes into this war. So yes, it, it may seem to conspiracy theorists as this was yet another bit of those jigsaw puzzle items which suggest that uh, Churchill knew the war was coming. From British intelligence and Australian British decrypts, uh, it was already clear to them that Japanese military and amphibious and other forces were on the move from about December the 1st onwards, and they were heading in various directions. The one direction they did not figure out the Japanese would be moving was across the North Pacific and then down onto Pearl Harbor itself. This really did strike them by surprise. I think Churchill in that first um, phone call to, to Roosevelt said, Mr. President, is it really true? Is mm -hmm. it Pearl Harbor? I mean, we are expecting it to be on Manila. We are expecting it to be Malaya, mm -hmm. but is it really Pearl Harbor? My, my, what historic times. One second point is I can't resist going back to his speech on the 23rd of December to the address about the children. Mm -hmm. Is it conceivable that Adolf Hitler or Stalin or anybody else like that might have referred to the need to have at least take some time off to think of the young children, to allow them to celebrate Christmas and to think that you are fighting this great struggle for their future. Yeah, it really showed the humanity of Winston Churchill, for sure. Um, John, a question came in from Charles. 
He said, in Malaysia, the loss of the USS Houston, one of Roosevelt's favorite ships, and the HMS Prince of Wales occurred, uh, occurred shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, did the loss of these two ships influence the response of Roosevelt and Churchill in when just establishing their naval strategy in the Pacific? Uh, on December 10th, 1941, as you've said, the Prince of Wales and uh, the battle cruiser Repulse for Zen yeah, was destroyed by uh, land-based, not carrier-based, land-based naval aircraft operating out of the region around Saigon, southern Vietnam. They were reaching out at extreme range. It was very lucky that they were able to first find the Prince of Wales and Repulse, and then get a, an air assault uh, on it um, in a time before any satellite overhead intelligence and the rest. Uh, they were dependent upon a submarine that found it. The uh, Admiral in charge of Force Zed, Tom Phillips, made a mistake. He should have headed right back to Singapore after he sorted into the South China Sea. Instead, he got intelligence that said there was a landing of Japanese troops down the coast of Malaya. So he made a detour. And it, what happened was in daytime, he was within range of these Japanese bomber and torpedo planes that made short work of four Z. Uh, Admiral Phillips, by the way, went down with his ship on the Prince of Wales. Uh, the British fleet was being constituted at that time in the Indian Ocean. And Force Z was the vanguard of a larger fleet that was being built up. Uh, as Paul mentioned, the Japanese carriers, after having struck that blow at Pearl Harbor, raced across the Pacific. And then in April of 1942, sorted in five of the six Japanese carriers sorted into the Indian Ocean. Uh, if you looked at battleship strength, the British had five battleships in the Indian Ocean. The Japanese only had four with this carrier task force. So if you were using battleships as your metric, the British fleet was actually superior to the Japanese fleet. But the reality is British carrier aviation was not nearly, not nearly as good as the Japanese. And so um, uh, the British fleet runs away, gets out of harm's way, retreats all the way across the Indian Ocean to the mm -hmm. east coast of Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan, if it had more ground troops, could have carried out an invasion of modern day Sri Lanka and off the coast of India. Uh, uh, Britain, the premier naval power, is running away. That shows you what Paul mentioned earlier, just how strong Japanese carrier aviation was in relation to the rest of the world. And when the Japanese then turned back against the US in response to the Doolittle raid, uh, uh, they faced the American carrier force in the Coral Sea and Midway. And these are two closely won battles. And uh, we were fortunate in many ways, had some luck at Midway to be able to sink those four Japanese carriers and turn the tide there. Um, so uh, for Britain and the US, the losses at Pearl Harbor, then the loss of Force Z, Churchill said, Britain and the US are naked throughout the Pacific. We don't have the fleets to uh, uh, constituted now to really stop the Japanese and go on the offensive. Uh, and that continues until Midway. And then uh, in the aftermath of Midway, the US feels confident enough to carry out an offensive. And in August of 1942, we land Marines on Guadalcanal. Uh, in some ways, that might have been a premature offensive. Uh, but as Paul said, for about six months, we're very much on the defensive. The British running away, and we just barely holding on uh, in the in the in the Pacific. Do you think if again counterfactual, um, always fraught, but very interesting question, and and uh, just just came to my mind, if the Repulse and the uh, Prince of Wales were not sunk, would they have put up? A, would they have turned the tide with the Japanese? Uh, invasion of the Philippines? Do you think they would have made a difference or do you think the air power and the manpower were just overwhelming? Uh, the Japanese air power in Southeast Asia, uh, mm -hmm. operating out of Vietnam and then advanced bases as they come down Malaya, 
the, the British uh, are, are just not, don't have a competitive air force. And that, and that helps explain the defeat at Singapore and Malay and Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Japan has air superiority to carry out a successful offensive uh, uh, in the Second World War, either at sea or on ground, you have to have air superiority. Britain doesn't have that. There was a debate about what to do with Force Z. Admiral Phillips decided on his own to strike north into the South China Sea to disrupt the invasion force, the transports that he thought were out there. Uh, there was a debate going on, though, within Britain, uh, among the British leaders, what to do with Force Z. And uh, they concluded they were moving towards saying Force Z should get out of Singapore and go back into the Indian Ocean to be with the fleet that was being built up uh, uh, there. So if Phillips uh, had not sorted he probably would have retreated either to Australia mm. or back to the Indian Ocean. I don't think it would have made much of a difference because Britain doesn't have the carrier air force or the land-based air power uh, where the fleet would be successful. In fact, uh, to try to fight in a hostile air environment would have been a disaster for the British fleet. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I, will, I greatly appreciated this conversation. I'm gonna end by answering a last question. This is from uh, Salal in, in Turkey. Um, he, two part questions. I'll, I'll answer the second one. Uh, he, he says, was Tur Turkey was hit by a car in America? Did this happen during this visit? Um, no, Salal. So that happened in, uh, 19, it's either the end of 1929 and 1930. I'm thinking 1930. Churchill had lost all of his money in the stock market, American stock market crash. And he came over to do a lecture tour to, to make more money, which is the story of Churchill's life in terms of finances. Um, and he was in New York. He was searching for the home of Bernard Baruch on Fifth Avenue, a, a longtime friend of Churchill's, a famous New Yorker. And he stepped out of the car, stepped out of the taxi, looked the wrong way because he was from the United Kingdom and the Americans drive in separate ways, as you probably know and was hit not by a taxi, but was hit by a, I believe an Italian American driving home from work. And he was, and the man was going the speed limit. He wasn't speeding. He just hit a guy who was walking across the street. And my favorite, two favorite parts of the story, Salal, is one, Churchill uh, mm. asked his longtime uh, advisor, Professor Lindemann to calculate the force in which he was hit by the car so that he could tell people that he had been hit by X amount of force and survived. And then second, the famous um, prescription during, so America was in, uh, in prohibition against alcohol and his uh, doctor, his American doctor prescribed him an unlimited quantity of alcohol to uh, help him in his recovery. So as only Winston Churchill. So uh, thank you for the question. Thank you all for attending. Paul, thank you very much for your time th this afternoon. Thank you. My great pleasure to be with John, both of you. Thank you. And thank you, John, for your time. Thank, thank you, you for arranging this, Justin. Thank you. And wishing you all wonderful, uh, wonderful holidays uh, and take care. Thank you for, for joining in on this webinar. Thank you very much indeed. Take care. Thank you.